It is an international conservation effort to save biodiversity. I think it represents hope. Welcome to the most biodiverse place in the world. Welcome to the Millennium Sea Bank at Wakehurst. Nestled amidst Kew's wild botanic garden in the heart of Sussex, the Millennium Seed Bank uses cutting-edge science to create a Noah's Ark for plant life. Plants are under threat for many reasons, climate change, man's population growth and the need for agriculture. It's Kew's mission to safeguard plants and the easiest way to safeguard plants long term is a seed in a vault like this. This is an ultra long term seed bank and once you've stored the seeds, if you've got it right, they won't die. So if climate change does get really bad, we can put seeds back. Kew's had a seed bank here since 1976 when we first moved from Kew. The original seed bank came down in the back of an estate car, so it was a drummer for drying and a chest freezer for freezing. It was that basic, but the principle was still the same. And we then had various iterations of the seed bank in the mansion. And this then was conceived in 1997. And here we are now, the world's largest seed bank. We set out to collect the whole of the UK collection. And we collected 97% of the UK's native flora, which is about 1,400 species. And we were the first country in the world to attempt it. And we did it in partnership with various charities in the UK. And the reason we did it in 97 was so that when we came to launch the seed bank in the millennium, we could then say to other countries, look, we've banked our flora, we want to help you bank yours. The scientists at the Millennium Seed Bank work with colleagues across the world who collect seeds they can store here to safeguard their futures and the future of the planet. Just like a normal bank, the seeds can be stored for the future or used now to restore threatened landscapes, like the American Prairie here at Wakehurst. We've been very successful in developing partnerships with countries all over the world. We have seeds from 190 countries. We work in partnership both in the field when we're collecting, but also afterwards when we're doing research. All of that data goes onto our database and we share it. And we also import our partners' data to our database. And this sharing allows a big mountain of knowledge to develop around the species and helps us have very robust seed banks with a lot of science behind it. When a seed collection arrives, we pick it up from reception and take it through to the cleaning lab for initial unpacking. We will be checking the seeds are all there, that we have all the paperwork and um, any herbarium specimens if they're included. This is a herbarium specimen and it has various elements of the, of the plant. You've got the flower, the stems, the leaves, and in the packet here, you've got the seeds. It also has all the details of where it was collected, who it was collected from, and a unique number. And that unique number for the herbarium specimen links to the unique number for the seed specimen in the bank. Once they're unpacked, we will take them into the dry room to begin their drying process. In here we've got seeds stored in crates from all over the world. So at the moment we've got seeds from Pakistan, Georgia, Zambia, Madagascar, lots and lots of different places. The dry room works by circulating air over two drying units and these control the humidity and the temperature of the air in this room. So it's running at 18 degrees C and the humidity is about 15% relative humidity. For every 1% reduction in seed moisture content, its lifespan doubles. So that means that we can potentially increase their longevity by maybe 40 times over. So we keep the seeds in cloth bags or in paper bags, and this allows the moisture to be released so that the seeds can dry nicely in these crates. The way that we check that the seeds are dried is we use these rotronic meters. It measures the moisture content of the air surrounding the seeds. Once we're happy that the seeds have been dried, the next stage of the process is to clean them. So here we are in the cleaning lab. The purpose of cleaning seeds is to remove as much of the bulky plant material from our collection as possible so that we're just storing the seeds. One of the most important pieces of equipment that we use are sieves and they separate out different sizes of debris. So over here we've got an example of a hogweed or heraclium which we're cleaning. To remove the seeds from these bits of stick 
what we do is we just rub it through this large sieve size here. The seeds fall through this larger mesh and collect in the slightly smaller sieve size underneath. And then by shaking that at the bottom here, you can collect the dust and the debris that we don't want either. Sometimes the seeds arrive as wet fruits. It's easier to clean them while they're still wet than it is to allow them to dry because it would shrivel and become quite hard and make it harder to remove. So what Francis is doing is rubbing them through a large sieve using a rubber bung and then rinsing with a bit of water to remove the excess fruit pulp. What she's left with are these nice clean seeds. This is an entendrophragma from Ghana. It's a vulnerable tree due to its uses for timber and medicinal properties. It comes with this beautiful tail which helps it wind disperse, but we do not want to keep this because it adds to the bulk. So I'm just very gently rubbing it and then I can pop the sample that I've rubbed through the sieve, which then removes the smaller debris and allows me to aspirate the rest of the collection. I can just pop the collection in the top of the machine and then the seeds can very gently tumble through the airflow so that the lighter debris falls this side and the heavier seeds fall down this side. So now that the aspirator's finished, um, I have a nice clean sample of seeds and I can take them through to x-raying to see how the quality is. This is our digital x-ray machine. Uh, we use this so that we can look inside the seeds to tell the quality of the collection so that we know how many good seeds we've got and how many may not germinate. Now I've entered the data onto our database, I can pop this in the x-ray machine and we can x-ray it. This is our tree seed from Ghana and you can tell from this x-ray that we have 20 good seeds in here and you can see that the embryo is fully developed you can see the radicals, the first little roots that are about to pop out are all intact. Now I've x-rayed the collection and I've written the results on the card. We can take the sample over for counting. So the collection's now reached the counting stage. So it's been cleaned, it's been x-rayed, and now we need to determine the number of seeds in the collection because that enables us to know how many germination tests to set up. We need to know if we have enough seed to be able to do distribution to other organisations and also if we have very small seed numbers. We can ask our partners to recollect or we can regenerate the collection ourselves. So there's different ways of counting a collection. The most common way is to count five lots of 50 seeds. Then we'll weigh the final remainder and then our seed bank database will work out how many seeds we've got. So it's a lot less time consuming than counting every single seed by hand. Beneath the laboratories, bomb-proof, fire-proof and flood-proof innovations take security to a whole new level. Once the seeds have been cleaned, counted and logged on the database, they're ready to be stored in the freezing cold vaults below at minus 20 degrees Celsius. We have around 40,000 different species of plants from 190 countries and that's just in excess of 90,000 collections. So we have literally billions of seeds banked beneath us. It's the safest seed bank in the world. It's designed to take the impact of a plane and also a bomb above. This is the cauldron complex which holds all the seeds. If you look at the bottom there, you'll see the cauldrons are built off the ground and that is so that if we have a flood, it allows us time to get flood pumps to prevent the seeds getting wet because they need to stay dry. Up here, we have a very sensitive sniffer fire system and if it goes off, it will set the alarms off and we'll have the brigade here very, very, very quickly. The MSB is considered a vital facility, so if an incident were to happen, numerous fire brigades from across Sussex would arrive in minutes. When the seeds are brought downstairs, they are separated into two samples, the active sample and the base sample. The seeds in the active sample are used over the next few months and years for research and germination testing. The seeds in the base sample are put away into long-term storage. Both samples are sealed in airtight containers, either a glass jar or a foil bag, and they are stored with a silica sachet, which absorbs any moisture that may form in the container. Before banking, we now need to seal the foil bag using a heat sealer. Once all the containers are sealed, we can allocate the collection a unique serial number. This is for security purposes, and because scientists like to play around with name changes, it means we won't have to change the names on all the bottles if they do so. Once the labels are on, I now need to put on my cold room coat, 
to go into the freezer. The vault below us has currently six cauldrons, and of those six cauldrons, about four are full or nearly full. So my hope is that we get more funding, we do more sea collecting, and we fill the vault to capacity. I want to be worried about building the next extension to the Millennium Sea Bank. Ninety percent of all types of seeds can be stored in the freezers. Seeds that can be stored like this are known as orthodox seeds. In the seed bank, they will last for hundreds of years. But there is another type of seed that can't be stored in the freezers. Seeds like avocado and mango seeds are not able to be frozen. These are known as recalcitrant seeds. This is a recalcitrant seed. Recalcitrant seeds are usually large. This is the largest seed. It's the Coco de Mer from the Seychelles. And they can't be dried. And if you can't dry them, you can't freeze them because you get ice nucleation. So that 9% of recalcitrant species have to be stored in a different way, including cryogenics. Welcome to our cryo storage facility. This is where we keep our short-lived and exceptional species. We store them in specialist cryo vials and there are ultra-low temperatures in liquid nitrogen. Once you've stored the seeds, they can last for tens, hundreds or thousands of years without loss of viability. We need to be able to grow the seeds to make sure that the plants are okay. Germination research is really important. And so we have research labs that do molecular research and we also do a lot of research on the seeds themselves. So the reason that we actually do the germination tests, firstly we need to know that the seed collection is actually alive. The other reason is if we want to use the seeds for restoration or scientific research, we need to know how to grow them, we need to know how to tell other people to grow them. Our seed collections come from many different countries, with many different climates, from many different species. So we need to choose germination conditions that are going to match those climates from where those seeds have originated. The majority of seeds that we hold have dormancy built into them as a survival mechanism. Dormant means they won't necessarily grow when you give them the perfect conditions. And for us, we have to learn how to break all those dormancy mechanisms in order to grow them in the lab. One type of dormancy is called physical dormancy. That actually prevents water from entering the seed. So in the wild, that would be overcome through natural fire or being eaten by an animal. And then the seeds would germinate post that event. In the lab, we mimic that by using a microscope and a scalpel, and we'll actually just take a tiny piece of the seed coat away from the seed. The seeds are then laid onto a small petri dish of agar and vitamins that allow the seeds to germinate in the incubators. After they've germinated, they are examined by the scientists, and the results are recorded. I can see here we have some germinated seed. In just one week, most of them have germinated, and that's a result of that scalpel and forceps treatment. This plate is without the chip. And we do have a few seeds which have germinated, a few seeds which look a little bit mouldy, so we can cut those to check the quality. And we can now see that we actually do require the chip to, to get full germination for this species. We will always set a test within the first few months of storage, and then we will continue to test the collections after that. So usually at around a 10 year interval. The reason we need to do the test every 10 years or so is that Seed lifespan will vary between the collections. So it's very important that we know the seeds are alive now and that they're alive in the future. In most cases, some of the seeds have not germinated. So we need to find out why. And we'll do that by cutting each of those seeds under a microscope. Once we've um, scored all of the germinated seed and accounted for each of the ungerminated seed, we can calculate our germination percentage and then we will use that result to monitor the collection through time. Most of the seedlings that we produce, we don't need to keep, but occasionally we might need to check that we have the correct species or we're using the plants for restoration. In that case, we'll actually grow these seedlings on into plants. There are a variety of reasons why the seeds may be grown into plants. A herbarium specimen may be needed to verify the seeds are the right ones, or a species might need to be regenerated for a new seed sample to be collected. 
Sometimes seeds are grown so a plant species can be restored and reintroduced to the wild following a climate catastrophe such as a wildfire. So now that I have the seedlings, uh, they'll live in here. It's temperature controlled um, at about 20 degrees. We have three other zones which set at various different temperatures for tropical or more temperate um, climates. And we have an outside area as well, which is more suited to UK and European species. I think it's very easy for people to get detached from where food comes from. All of our food is ultimately plant-based and when we want to go and relax in a, in a conservation area or in a forest, that's all plant-based. And We need to preserve those, they're not going to preserve themselves. We get lots of education groups visit and they are school, primary school, secondary school or university and we also have students that come here on placements. So by telling them what we're doing and how we're conserving, hopefully it's encouraging them A to get involved in science but B also to think more about the natural environment and how to protect it. We've set the benchmark really high. So when we started, we were the first international seed bank. There are now other large seed banks globally. And these seed banks are doing what we are doing. And so globally, the message has spread. And that message is banking seeds and saving plants. When we give talks and tours to, to visitors, they really enjoy them and the feedback we get makes us feel as though what we're doing is valued. As custodian of the world seeds, the Millennium Seed Bank plays a crucial role, not only supporting conservation efforts today, but for future generations as well. You can't do things without people, and I've met lots of amazing people, both partners and at Kew, and we have achieved an awful lot, but there's a lot more to do. Sir David Attenborough has described the work that we do as perhaps the most important conservation initiative ever. The MSB is, is hope, it's hope personified. <laughs>